Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I sent in uh, a suggestion on, of, of uh, two possible case studies uh, without thinking too much about it, uh, how to uh, actually uh, evaluate the uh, value of information uh, in, with the regard to the, the cases. But uh, uh, this is uh, one topic that I think is quite interesting in many respects, and, and uh, most of my slides are basically on the on the background of this topic, and it, uh, as it, the title says, it uh, involves the uh, the effects of soil structure interaction on the excitation and response of of uh, buildings subjected to near and far field strong motion. And uh, uh, just for uh, repeated information, I think I have. Uh, showed you this uh, some time before, but uh, Iceland is uh, pulled apart by the uh, Eurasian and the American plate. And in the uh, south of Iceland, uh, we have a transfer zone uh, where we have uh, fairly strong uh, earthquakes. So we have the South Iceland seismic zone, as you can see there. And uh, in the past uh, uh, 17 years, we've had uh, three big earthquakes in this uh, area. Uh, in 2000, we had two uh, uh, earthquakes, approximately 6.5, uh, in the uh, eastern part and then the middle part here. And then uh, in 2008, we had a uh, uh, 6.3 magnitude earthquake in uh, uh, just uh, east of uh, Kveragerði. <coughs> and of course, when these uh, earthquakes occur, it's not uh, a single event. Uh, it's a multitude uh, of events. So you have uh, one main event and then you have uh, uh, post events that uh, may go on for a year or, or longer. So we have uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, data available. But uh, uh, in 1999, <coughs> this building was instrumented uh, and it's instrumented in the, uh, the basement with a triaxial accelerator and then on the uh, uh, top floor, the third floor, just uh, uh, and there we are measuring the east-west, uh, the north-south motion and the east-west motion. Uh, and this is uh, basically the only uh, building that is instrumented uh, for uh, response measurements uh, in this uh, seismic uh, region, except uh, uh, power plants that are uh, on the outskirts of, of the seismic zone, and therefore not as uh, sensitive. Uh, <coughs> so uh, what we discovered when we uh, compared the uh, response of the building uh, in the June 21st uh, earthquake, which was uh, about 15 kilometers away, and then uh, the response in the 6.3 earthquake on May 29th in 2008, which was uh, uh, five to eight kilometers away uh, from the building, was that we had uh, very strong dissimilarities in the structural response for these two events. And uh, <coughs> uh, the response spectra don't uh, show that uh, maybe too clearly, but still we can see that uh, the, the, the response uh, for the uh, latter event in 2008, is, is uh, uh, has a very strong peak in the uh, sort of uh, about the five sec uh, zero point five second uh, uh, period, which is not uh, as strongly seen in the previous event, and the damage to the building was uh, fairly limited. There was some cracking to be seen in 2008, but uh, not that severe. Uh, there was some uh, uh, damage to interior <coughs> because of uh, high acceleration levels. But this is actually in the basement of the building. Uh, recently installed uh, book rack. Uh, but uh <coughs> when we looked at uh, the uh, uh, response in uh, 2000, uh, the earthquake was further away and we had uh, a horizontal peak ground acceleration of 13 and 11 percent g in each uh, direction. And uh, then we had, uh, uh, on the third floor, we were measuring up to uh, 
30, 36% of G. So we had about uh, three times larger uh, accelerations uh, on the third floor than in the basement. However, in, in uh, 2008, uh, the horizontal PGA was uh, 54 and 33% G in each direction. But uh, on the third floor, we had 72% uh, of G. And uh, in general, we had uh, only about 1.4 times larger uh, response on the third floor than in the basement, uh, which was uh, surprising uh, because uh, you would expect uh, this on a stiff foundation to be at least 2.5 times uh, magnification uh, from basement to, to the uh, third floor. <coughs> and when we looked at the uh, spectral information, these are just power spectral densities of uh, the relative acceleration between basement and uh, top floor. Then we see that uh, uh, basically the frequency content has shifted down in frequency from uh, what we saw in, in June uh, 2000. So what's the uh, reason? What, what lies behind this? And it took us uh, a while to sort of come up with a, uh, a hypothesis. But uh, if, uh, what is uh, traditional in, uh, in uh, soil structure interaction studies is to use uh, study or look at uh, the horizontal uh, vertical spectral ratios. And when we evaluate those, uh, we see that in 2000, we had a very strong response at eight, approximately eight hertz. <coughs> but then in uh, 2008, we had a very strong response at uh, about two hertz. And uh, <coughs> this is just a demonstration of analysis that I did uh, in 2002 or three, where I was looking at the uh, main events and, and post events uh, from those previous earthquakes. And, and there basically in all, all the data, the uh, eight frequency, the eight hertz uh, frequency was uh, very uh, strong. And the actual uh, natural frequency of the structure was, was not uh, as dominant, but it's, it's uh, around six, uh, hertz, the first uh, natural frequency. So uh, <coughs> the reason, uh, well, our hy hypothesis is, and we, we are fairly confident, that uh, uh, the fact is that during the Ice Age, uh, several uh, interglacial periods occurred, and then we had sea level rising up to about 100 meters above the present coastline. So a large part of uh, South Iceland was under sea, accumulating uh, sea sediments uh, on top of uh, the uh, rock uh, foundation. And uh, then in, uh, after the uh, uh, Holocene, uh, after the uh, gl gl glacial uh, or the Asia ice ages, then uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, volcanic activity in Iceland, and in uh, 8,500 years ago, uh, there was a big lava flowing uh, over a large portion of South Iceland, and therefore flowing over the uh, soft sediments. So, uh, <coughs> and then of course these uh, lavas, which are, uh, even though it's 8,500 years old, it's, it's not really a very old rock, in uh, geological, uh, in the geolo geological sense, and that is also uh, uh, has different compositions. So th we have a, comp uh, uh, a compound lava, and we have uh, scoria lava, which have uh, different characteristics. Uh, these are much uh, we weaker than uh, the uh, compound lava layers, and uh, so this is a. A hypothetical rock soil profile based on uh, information from a borehole uh, near to the building. And uh, then we have a compound layer uh, on top. So when people are building their structures, they think they're 
building uh, on solid rock. Uh, underneath the compound lava, there is a scoria lava layer. You know, and underneath the scoria lava layer, there is uh, sediments, gravel, sand, and clay. And then below that, there is uh, uh, older rock, 1.5 billion years old. And uh, this has been studied for, uh, from, uh, for uh, based on ground motion uh, data from other areas, such as Quiragirli, uh, where we have a, a seismic array. And then uh, <coughs> it has been seen that uh, if you split up the data, it, depending on the corner frequency, so the lower corner frequency of the uh, Fourier spectra, the acceleration, uh, then you can identify two peaks in the data. And uh, uh, about uh, between two and three hertz, and, and then uh, around eight hertz. So, uh, <coughs> So this is uh, it's fairly well uh, established. Yeah. Uh, so <coughs> I'm just going to skip these. These are uh, this is a just tower that I did a very simplified model for, uh, considering the uh, lava structure, and I got a good fit with the measured uh, natural frequency uh, from uh, post events. And so uh, the, the outstanding questions are uh, how to distinguish between foundation frequencies and uh, structural frequencies, and how to properly evaluate the natural frequency adapting of, of a structure when it's positioned uh, on, on, on such a complex uh, foundation layers. And, uh, and the fact is that uh, in uh, for the, for the building in question, the foundation actually acted as, in, in my opinion, as a seismic uh, isolation. So uh, I think the building would have been severely damaged uh, if it had actually had a magnification of uh, a factor three rather than 1.4. And uh, but however, but of course, if, if uh, it would have been a different type of building, a high, more high-rise building uh, with a natural frequency close to to hertz, uh, and of course, the magnification would have been uh, even stronger. So there are several things to uh, consider, and I'm, I'm not really proposing to to study this case uh, in detail. I, I think it's more sort of suitable to to consider a, a simplified scenario that is uh, uh, reflecting uh, reality in a sense. So that uh, we could uh, select earthquake action layers, uh, levels, uh, different amplitudes and distance. Uh, we could look at different foundation systems that would, uh, for instance, uh, reflect these two cases where we have uh, a stiff uh, foundation as a reference uh, or uh, an 8 hertz uh, stiff. Or foundation system with an 8 hertz uh, natural frequency and, and the 2 hertz natural frequency, and uh, that would affect the hazard for a particular building. And then we could uh, maybe study different building types low rise, medium rise, high rise, and evaluate the response. And, uh, and based on that, uh, maybe the risk. And then uh, the value of information uh, would basically be. Uh, the difference uh, in risk because if we don't have any monitoring, nobody would know about this. So uh, we can either save or, or we, we can we are either underestimating the risk uh, for, for instance, high risk buildings, or we are overestimating the risk for uh, low risk buildings. And then, of course, if we could uh, provide argumentation for. Uh, Further monitoring or, or further information gathering that would be important. So that's uh, what I have. Okay. Thank you very much.
The purpose to have a class of buildings here, so medium rise, high rise buildings, to, to yeah. evaluate the value of information for a class of buildings for different, because this yeah, is going a little bit different, uh, it's a, a little bit another approach, not approach, another case study, just to say, uh, only as a remark, not as a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if we, I think it's not practical to uh, analyze uh, or uh, for, for this uh, uh, for the cost action. I think it's maybe not uh, practical to analyze the, uh, the building and the, the local conditions uh, in too much detail. I think that might be from uh, out of the scope of, of interest here. But, but to do a sort of parametric. Uh, Type of study you could uh, that would uh, reflect the uh, issue. Yeah. Maybe and, you and, and uh, I'm not. Uh, but you could select the simple limit state like the intra-story drift between two stories as a limit state and uh, look what would be with and without the monitoring. Uh, I don't know what all you would be. Yeah. I, I, well, basically, it's not uh, with it without monitoring. It's it's uh, if you don't have monitoring. It, don't know about uh, the effects. Yeah, you, you can. So, so, so it's uh, it, 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 there's no monitoring. Everyone assumes that the foundation is stable. Yeah. And then you build your buildings and okay. you, uh, you do your risk evaluation. So and you for, you for for, for okay. instance, uh, insurance purposes. The value of monitoring and is the highest for the foundation assessment. Is yeah, it's it's basically yeah. uh, that's okay. the value. I, I agree. You, yeah, yeah. You, you, you know more. Yeah, yeah. You understand better uh, the, the real risks than, than you would without the 